All right, to finish off this chapter, let's just look at some of these fuels. All right, so we have coal, very complex mixture of substances, and then we get, you know, formed over a long period of time, and we get these different types of coal. Um, this anthracite that has the lowest moisture is found the deepest underground. Um, so higher grades of coal contain more in energy, and so anthracite is going to be a slightly higher grade. Um, bituminous um, is not too much different than anthracite, and then the lignite has the least amount of energy to it. Asia-Pacific countries use a ton of coal, followed by Africa, Europe, and the U.S. And so there's a lot of drawbacks, though. Mine safety, environmental harm by mining and combustion. Ash pollutes the air. Other toxic components get carried around. And so coal is still used quite a bit. Petroleum, oils are used a lot as well. Um, natural gas, these are not clean fuels though. So we're ending up with a situation where we continue to burn all of the stuff and you can see, you know, over time, you know, the sharp rise in, you know, using these fossil fuels. Um, we've had a shift from coal to oil in the mid 1950s, we found oil in Texas, boom, let's use our oil. Uh, and so in 1950, that was the first year that we saw more petroleum usage than coal. So we do get more energy per gram of petroleum than we do coal. Uh, we do have a reserve worldwide. Basically what the problem is, is we've got, you know, this ex rate of extraction. Uh, we're using more than we produce. Not only that, there's all sorts of different areas that are kind of hot pocket areas where oil is found. And so um, there's a lot of issues with trying to get access to oil and, you know, kind of the socio-political climate that exists in areas that um, mine the oil or extract the oil and then the countries that are trying to use it. So a lot of different, a lot of different issues with that. Um, there's a process called fracking, which is how they obtain natural gas or petroleum from hard rock formations. Um, highly controversial. People think that this is destabilizing the rock formations, which can lead to seismic activity because it does involve drilling down into the rock, um, adding in that fracking fluid, you interject in pressure, and then you cause cracks so that things can flow. So. We've got our hydrocarbons, okay, so like oil, the gasoline that's refined, gasoline is refined oil, it's mixed up of a lot of different hydrocarbons, so here's some of the hydrocarbons, you've got methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, and octane, so you're just increasing the number of carbons and therefore the number of hydrogens uh, with each one. And so at a certain point, it switches from being a gas at room temperature to a liquid at room temperature due to these intermolecular forces that um, hold everything together in between molecules. So our hydrocarbons, we've got tons of different hydrocarbons in our gasoline. And our crude oil is a mixture of several thousand compounds, with the majority being these hydrocarbons um, that are somewhere between the 5 and 12 chain carbon atoms. And so we get different boiling points due to differing intermolecular force strength. So we can use distillation to separate our crude oil into various components. Um, and so basically the way distillation, fractional distillation works is we start off at a temperature where the component that has the lowest boiling point will boil. And so it boils, it goes into the vapor phase, and then it goes into something where it will be collected and then usually there's something cool that runs along the outside of it so it promotes the condensation back into a liquid and we can collect it and so um, as the temperature rises so this is a little different kind of situation where um, it's got different collection points based on those and so hydrocarbons with higher boiling points they vaporize eventually and then they go up the shower and then they are collected and so um, 87 percent of each barrel is used for transportation and for heating when we look at our oil there and so again that 
when we look at these boiling points, we've got this volatility, how easily we can go into the uh, gaseous phase. And so we've got three different main types of intermolecular forces. When we talk about hydrocarbons, it's our dispersion forces or London forces. We call them London dispersion forces now. Um, that happen. And so if I've got one molecule and another molecule, there's these dispersion forces that attract them to each other. And so they're kind of like tethers, molecular tethers. And so um, we want to, when we vaporize, we break that tether. So when they're in li the liquid form, they're all next to each other. And then when we vaporize it, we are breaking that tether and sending it into the gaseous phase because gases are super far apart from each other. Um, and so we get different boiling points based on the intermolecular forces that things have. Water has really high intermolecular forces. So water actually has a very unusually high boiling point, which is really important to um, a lot of things. If water had a lower boiling point, we'd have problems. <laughs> okay. um, large demand for gasoline. We've got a lot of cars out there. Um, and other things. And so higher boiling point fractions, we crack them into smaller molecules by heating them. And so we can use something called a catalyst to lower that temperature. And so we get this catalytic reforming, we rearrange atoms. Um, and so if we have something that is long versus something that's balled up, we end up with stronger intermolecular forces when it's long than when it's balled up because if you think about it like more points of attraction so if I had my two arms this is harder to rub against each other and separate than if like I'm just balled up and I'm just doing my hands there so we can get compounds we can get molecules with the same formula but different structures so here is a picture a and b exact same formula if you count up the carbons and hydrogens in both of these they'll be the same so these are what are known as isomers of each other um, and so the longer chain is going to have stronger dispersion forces it's going to have um, higher um, boiling points and so the non-linear isomers are usually going to have lower boiling points catalysts Basically, they just lower what's called the activation energy. So an activation energy is the energy required to get a reaction going. A catalyst just provides an alternate pathway for the reaction to occur. And so that ends up lowering that activation energy. So it makes the reaction go with less energy. So um, it makes things go faster because we can get the activation energy down. If we need this much energy versus this much energy to run a reaction, this much energy is going to go faster than this much energy. And then we have all sorts of different types of fuels, um, like ethanol, it's an alcohol with an OH or a hydroxyl group. Our oxygen, oxygenated fuels have less energy per amount burned than gasoline. So if you look at like ethanol versus octane, octane has a lot more energy in it than ethanol does. And then biofuels, these are renewable derived from biological sources, such as trees, grasses, agricultural crops. Um, and so, way of exploring things that we could use that um, are renewable and that we won't necessarily run out of very quickly.